very scorny roof. I don't already show your face. Uh, and uh, I'm here to present uh, excellent books to move away from P-Tabs. Um, yeah. And uh, I will start by showing you a timeline of uh, the things I've worked with, uh, which uh, starts at 995, when we first issued the uh, capital restrictions. Uh, and the first step was, uh, the first step will be given to the coordinated substances p -tabs was in 2002 when the P-Shop banned the uh, and a couple of years later we realized we had to uh, also substitute the uh, PFLA and once we did that, that's when we really realized we had to look at a group approach uh, because there were so many concerns uh, increasing about uh, the whole substance group, group performance in substances. Um, so we started looking at these uh, in, uh, in general uh, and mapping where we have them in our supply chain specifically. Oh, sorry, I did that. It's good. Okay, so um, uh, what we realized was that uh, our main application of performing the substances was not surprisingly as we to the pallets for uh, up to uh, <coughs> a term, basically. And especially, we started with being at the limit the kids shown couples uh, and rules that they were during which time. Uh, so we started looking at what can we do here, how can we, uh, uh, how can we get a hold of actually peace guys of time, peace as free alternatives. Uh, and one that took a while, uh, simply because it wasn't landing the seed to the junction come across seed. They were completely free fast free at the time. Uh, in 2010, we managed that they issued our first term on uh, PFAS free overall. And in uh, late 2013, early 2014, we felt the time was right to, um, to implement a full on PFAS restriction. Um, across the board, the entire group of substances. Um, so, you know, that, that looks fine, and uh, I would be very happy if I could just end my presentation here and say this will be succeeded on, and you know, put <coughs> this and try my path. But let's start by looking at the product scope, because uh, we do not just sell a feral, uh, but we do sell uh, as much of um, a feral as well. So, uh, that is our main group. Uh, we also use uh, watercolour fishing for uh, umbrellas, shoes, uh, bags. So all of those we had to live get similar alternatives for and a similar approach. Uh, and what we also uh, had issues with for a long time afterwards when it came to these products which was uh, cross contamination of factories. And this is an issue with, with the first one of the first brands to get a full on battle or something is that you know industry hasn't caught up so even if uh even if there were no peace fasteners to uh, um, distribute our products those were still used for other brands i suppliers and then when you have subsequent finishing such as coding lamination which i'll put on for good um that's when you get cross so for several years we still had issues with that, uh, but it took a while and finally the industry caught up with this uh, and, uh, and we were able to remove uh, you know, the exception we had for technical impurities. And, uh, and at the same time as we implemented our general restriction for PFAS, that's also when we were really expanding our product scope within the company. So we moved into like the home assortment, so started doing like shower curtains, that's also the word non zero but we also started doing food contacts, uh, and these trolley eggs, etc. Um, and in some ways I think we were very fortunate because because of the fact that we already had the PSAS restriction in place, uh, we we basically just used it as a way to, uh, as a pre-workers, Prerequisite when sourcing for these uh, for these new product groups for the company, um, but uh, yeah, it's still a <coughs> still a bit. So, uh, however, then in 2016, uh, the the, um, 
uh, a report actually highlighted the issue with cosmetics and it's already been touched for a couple of times here today. Uh, and this was definitely something that was um, a bit of a news slash at the time. Uh, so we had to really stop looking at this. Um, but what I really want to you know, say, and it's already been said also, but I'm going to say it again, what's really nice about cosmetics is you actually get a full list of contents. And that you do not think for the other going finish its use. But for cosmetics, you actually get that. So with that in hand, it was fairly easy to do the mapping. We found two applications of performing liquid substances in our cosmetic equipment. Um, they were subsequently substituted. Uh, and in 2019, we could implement. I can't think of any tax restriction. Uh, so, you know, now if we revisit the timeline and look at it again, we see that it, you know, quite clearly shifted shape. Uh, and um, it's not, it's not anymore an active face out substitution project, but what we're seeing it <coughs> as is a continuous <coughs> monitoring uh, project or we did it something we still need to remain on top of. Uh, and this is especially true when, you know, in the past few years we've seen detections of peace acid incoming water due to launch suppliers. Uh, so that is really a scary way of thinking about these substances is so wrong. Uh, and of course we also have the regulatory activities uh, which we're very welcoming uh, towards. Um, we, we appreciate that finally we're getting to catch up. Um, but this, this will definitely, uh, for example, there's a, um, some uh, regulations that we look at basically the carbon fluoride long bond and basically adding that. So that means that we, we have we need to keep track of all oh, sure, I mean, that product. And if from a couple of years from now, so we've accepted it from that, so we don't have no test plans, etc. So you know, it goes on. We, we will never get rid of now of the issue of pieces. That's very accurate. Oh. Um, so uh, I was also going to say that you know even if uh, even if we're you know done substituting PFAS in a way, we are now looking at uh, other substances that are you know on uh, substances of concern or what I think. You should call them most harmful capitalists. Um, and and uh, for example, we're looking at endocrine disruptors, misphenol, salt misty, uh, but also other endocrine disruptors that are not never remitted or otherwise classified. Uh, we're looking at uh, solid base polyurethanes. So, with both the PFAS project and all of these other substitution projects, what we're always facing is a lack of information about the chemical um, the chemicals used in our supply chain. And this is really um, uh, what, where, where it's you know, tough to be, have a very um, low downstream user. Because uh, they're ready to know, but our uh, H&M group does not own any suppliers, we manufacture at least, we buy products. And uh, these products are usually uh, produced at <coughs> several factories, and they buy chemicals so, and chemical suppliers. Um, so to get information is really you know, tricky sometimes. Uh, and what we do get, we get a chemical safety data sheet, or a yeah, safety data sheet. But what, you know, what we see there is usually not enough that will really tell us the habit with the classified substances. And as we know, uh, PFAS, for example, was not clarified generally um, 50 years ago, and they're still not today. So you can just imagine the issues of mapping with potential uses of PFAS, or as we do now, EDCs. That is extremely difficult. Uh, it requires so cool, um, here's a desktop research uh, and really good supplier relationships. Uh, but still, the information is often reported as trade secrets by the campus supplier services. Uh, we're, um, there's also an issue when, when you come to the substitution phase, you want to look at chemical substitutes, knowing if the alternatives are indeed safer, if they are indeed better 
uh, of course, to us, we've also has a perspective that's super tricky if, if you don't get the information. Uh, so uh, this is really about perhaps something I, I would, our wish would be that, you know, uh, policymakers and regulators really take this into account, especially now that we have the Green Deal and the not so ambitious plans. Uh, I will also share, you know, other learnings uh, more targeted perhaps towards other industry stakeholders in the room. Um, one of the big learnings for us, especially with the PSAS project, was to really ask yourself in the alternatives assessment what the primary function means, it really is, so you don't get that mixed up. Uh, when, um, when we looked at our use of the um, PSAS and so what if that was the fractal um, stuff, um, they, um, what we realized was it was exactly that. It was the water repellency. We, could, we did not need the orange sodium, you know, that kind of repellency. Uh, and that was obviously a really important starting point for us to understand that because that made it so much easier. Um, and even if the rest was not easy, but still that, that was really great. It's starting. It's 100 years. And then I also want to urge to to everyone to really think about staying ahead of legislation because the regulatory purchases has been so much time, uh, as we see now, almost to a PSHF. Uh, but it does pay off, even if it's really hard work, and then it's substituting your head of really short actions, and even if it um, is, you, you have to fight hard to get the information you need because it's all pretty available to you. Uh, it will pay off, uh, just as it is today in mean, and do you see the patient restrictions? Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's what I wanted to share with you. I also added a uh, link <coughs> on the final slide uh, to you, this one more match, our typical match in Dunbrook. So thank you. Thank you so much. I think we'll go to the portfolio. Zero PM. Zero pollution of persistent and mobile substances. This project has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme under grant agreement number 101036756.